Welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, airing live Monday nights on KGRARadio.com and now as a podcast on iTunes and wherever else you can find it. You can learn more at my member site, richarddolanmembers.com. Now, join me for a fascinating exploration of all the things you secretly want to talk about, from UFOs to government shenanigans, strange science, future tech, and more. Here on KGRA Radio, welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Greetings, it's June 4th, 2018. Once again, I find myself on the road, but I'm happy to have something new for you tonight. Earlier this week, I pre-recorded a fascinating conversation that I had with longtime UFO researcher, Peter Robbins, uh, who happens to be a very close friend of mine. Many people know of Peter through his book, Left at Eastgate, which he uh, co-authored in the late 1990s with former Air Force Airman Larry Warren. Over the last few years, a great deal of disrepute has come to Warren, and this has affected credibility of portions of the book itself. But Peter's always been well known as scrupulously honest, and it's a fact that I can attest to wholeheartedly, knowing knowing Peter as I do. Um, and Peter's got some seriously interesting elements to his story that don't always get out to the rest of the world, and tonight we're going to correct some of that. Uh, one thing that isn't universally known is that Peter got involved in the study of UFOs through his sister, the late Helen Robbins, also known as Helen Wheels. She was the lead singer of one of the most active punk rock bands of the late 1970s. Helen sang at CBGB's back in the day and was a colleague to all the big stars there, the Talking Heads, Patti Smith, the Ramones, and more. But Helen was also an abductee, and her story is quite amazing, and you're going to hear it tonight. Peter also has a lifelong interest in Wilhelm Reich, who's one of the most interesting figures of the 20th century for sure. Reich was a psychiatrist, he was an associate of Sigmund Freud, and had his own strong interest in UFOs, and actually much more. We're going to hear about that in the second segment of the program. You'll also hear Peter and me talking about one of our mutual areas of interest, which is the life and death of former U.S. Defense Secretary James Forrestal. I've talked a lot about Forrestal over the years, and so has Peter. Not surprisingly, we have lots to say about Forrestal's mysterious death and whether or not there's a valid connection to UFOs and all of that. And finally, I have Peter discuss an interesting and kind of forgotten moment of history, and that's the year 1978 when the United Nations openly discussed UFOs. Peter had his own role to play in that process, maybe a small one, but still, he was there, and he had a bird's eye view. Hope you enjoy my two-hour chat with Peter Robbins. Hi, Peter. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, glad to be back, Rich. It's always a pleasure. We're, we have known each other for more than 15 years. Uh, I'm thinking we first met in 2002 at the MUFON International Symposium, and uh, I think we've pretty much been buddies ever since. We have. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know that besides being colleagues, we are dear friends. We live relatively close together and we have had the great fun of sharing quite a number of adventures here and abroad and I'm sure several thousand miles of road trips all told. We've, we've had a number of odd couple style road trips, <laughs> I would say. Uh, they've all been good. <laughs> we've yeah, there is a so period. Bad. There is a period. Um, <laughs> Just a couple of years ago, I thought, oh, my God, I'm traveling with Peter again and again and again, again. like three or four times in a row around the country <laughs> and world. So uh, and that never has seemed really to stop entirely. Yeah. But I wanted to have you on uh, this program because it occurs to me, first of all, you have you have a lot to say on a number of topics that, in my opinion, people even now have not really heard enough of from you. I mean, it's very well known. You're the author of um, of the book Left at e your co-author of the book Left at Eastgate, and I don't even want to get into the all the various controversies uh, relating to your your former co-author uh, of that book. That's been out. Everyone's hashed things out, argued, and to me, it's actually not even interesting because it's actually not 
uh, an integral part of the UFO story, in my view. Um, Not that your research isn't part, but that whole controversy, for me personally, I'm just done with it. And um, you probably are too, as far as I (laughs) can tell. But there's other things um, that you have and I have talked about personally that you've talked about with sometimes small groups, sometimes larger groups. But the thing is, I don't really seem to hear some of these stories getting out within the larger UFO community, if we can call it that. And I yeah. think that they're important. So one, if, if you might, um, if you don't mind me just kind of uh, help, helping us jump in here. Yeah. You've been interested in this for a very long time. And in fact, you came into this subject through your sister, mm. your late sister, Helen. And would you mind telling people a little bit about her? She was famous. She was a mm-hmm. famous rock star. And she had abduction experiences. Would you mind telling yeah. a little bit about that? No, I'm glad to. Um, my sister's name, if you Google it, uh, you will get almost nothing because uh, Google will take you straight to the Paul McCartney song, Hell on Wheels. Um, in 1976, as the entire punk music scene was breaking in lower Manhattan, one of the bands that um, was starting up uh, that we were friends with, the Dictators, their lead singer, handsome Dick Manitoba, named my sister, uh, born Helen Robbins, Helen Wheels, a pun on Hell on yeah, Wheels. Yeah, really cool had, name. At four foot eleven, uh, she certainly did uh, project that persona. Uh, Helen went on to uh, write for Blue Oyster Cult, uh, became a golden platinum record award winning writer. Uh, had her own band for more than a decade, uh, different incarnations as the musicians went, but always performing under the name of uh, the Helen Wheels Band until uh, the last few years of her life when she performed with another group. And um, she was a poet. She was an artist. Uh, She had a degree in English literature. She was a graduate of the French Fashion Institute in New York, a brilliant seamstress, a funny, sweet, extraordinary woman who was also an amateur herpetologist, a scholar on reptiles. And um, I guess maybe it started when we were kids and I had pet snakes and horned toads and lizards. Uh, Neither of my sisters ever got to go through what I called the eek phase of being a girl. May I just add, uh, Peter, if if I may, (laughs) I, I just want people to know, like she, she performed live many times at CBGB's in New York. Oh yeah. Like she was in the entire punk uh, new wave scene in New York City. She knew everyone. She knew the talking heads. She knew Patti Smith. She played with these people. She knew the Ramones. She, and they all knew her. They were all uh, colleagues oh, yeah. with each other. And she was part of that whole scene. And I mean, that by itself, that's an amazing scene, right? It is. And, and that, for me, um, yeah. having grown up at a wonderful time in the world of popular music with uh, Motown and soul and rhythm and blues and uh, you know, no name groups like the uh, uh, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and the Who <laughs> busting into my childhood. When I started to hear the music of some of these bands in 76 on the radio, I, I had that moment of, oh, my God, I sound like my parents. What's all this crazy noise about? You know, I can't sound like regular heavy metal. Uh, and Helen said, no, you've got to come and see them. And she dragged me, not quite kicking and screaming, to CBGB's. Uh, the Ramones were playing. And I got it. I absolutely got it. And through Helen, I got to meet so many of these wonderful people. Um, Patti Smith, I had known since the late 60s through the group that went on to become the Blue Oyster Cult. She was the longtime girlfriend of uh, my friend Alan Lanier, their their remarkable uh, now past um, uh, keyboardist. Um, But uh, I think it was my very second UFO talk in a little rental hall on East 23rd Street as people were coming in front row center. And this would have been about 1977 was Debbie Harry and Chris Stein uh, sat down, gave me a big smile. And I thought, whoa, Uh, that's one of the loveliest people. Well, can we we, uh, transition here? Uh, Because (laughs) Helen sort of indirectly got or directly got you into the UFO field itself. Yes. Yes, And that's uh, let's segue there. In 1975, uh, I was um, following my dream from childhood of being a painter. 
uh, one who aimed at world-class ambition, uh, a, a major New York artist working during the day, uh, doing demolition and con contracting carpentry in that area we now call Soho that was being uh, turned over from old factories into galleries and residences and shops. Uh, I taught painting at my alma mater on Monday nights, the School of Visual Arts. Um, and I had a cool loft down in Chinatown, a nice girlfriend. Um, I was selling a few pieces a year, but I was living that dream. And for a combination of reasons that I can go into, on one particular afternoon, a repressed memory. As far as I know, I joke with people, if I have other repressed memories, I don't remember them. <laughs> but um, certainly the repressed memory from childhood came roaring back into my consciousness. I've never had an experience like it before or since. And I'm not a person whose life has been filled with paranormal you know, experiences and UFO sightings. But it literally took the top of my head off. And it was a very, very clear memory of... 14 plus years before, Helen and I, um, goofing around as kids do in front of the house on a, a very beautiful late morning in June in the early 60s, I caught something out of my right peripheral vision in the sky. And I should say here, one of those afternoons in a small bucolic village, no other kids playing, the mailman isn't going by, the good humor truck isn't there, no cars, nothing. And I caught something, and uh, I immediately called her attention to it. And we looked up as five silvery white, elliptical, you know, like a dinner plate tipped on its edge, um, uh -huh. objects, uh, obviously metallic, not shiny like stainless steel, more like, say, uh, you know, brushed aluminum or something, uh, in a very precise V, as in Victor, uh, type formation came in at a very high rate of speed and stopped above the house across the street. Uh, we looked up, we, many years later, uh, 14 plus years later, when we reviewed the experience together for the first time on the phone after my memory had returned that afternoon, we both agreed that we were able to make out regular detailing around the edge of each one of these disks that the closest way I can describe it is uh, windows on a commercial airliner at an appreciable distance. And I went through a reaction, Richard, that I've since documented, I'm sure, more than 100 times in interviews over the decades with uh, witnesses, experiencers, abductees. I call it the checklist reaction. You're living your life, minding your own business. You look up and you see a thing or things and your mind immediately goes through everything they're not. And as a 14 year old right. kid, my mind simply went, not planes, kites, blimps, balloons, helicopters, dirigibles, strange shaped clouds, reflections from the ground, flotsam and jetsam, birds. Oh my God, what am I looking at? I now know, I mean, it was clear to me reflecting back on it that I, of course, had heard about flying saucers. You couldn't be a kid at that point in America and not have known about it. They were a part of my life in the movies, the fantasy theater in Rockville Center, Long Island. Um, you know, once a month or so, I, my buddies and I would take our bicycles there and for a very small amount of money, see a couple of great B movies with terrible special effects and often, you know, destructive spacemen or giant bugs and things. But I... I understood that it was not real. Uh, I understood that adult message, and yet there they were. Uh, and I will again say they were completely, fully disc-shaped. It was a clear blue sky, not a cloud, as good a daylight of sighting as anyone could have. You know what's interesting and, about this? If I just may jump in for a minute. Yeah, please, how, always. How often it happens when people have these uh, unusual experiences that they then forget about them. Yes. You for, they forget about them for the longest time, as you did, and apparently as Completely. Helen did. And then, boom, years later, it hits you in a flash. And this, now, I mean, we both heard this so many times. Yeah. And um, in the many years that I had the privilege of working as the assistant to Bud Hopkins, and we know that they, for lack of a better term, um, can affect your memory, turn things off. Um, this was not that. I came away from that experience all too aware of what I had seen. And 
extremely uncomfortable with it. Uh, I, I now know from years of therapy after the fact and uh, common sense, understanding more and more about the nature of boys and girls at these ages. Helen was just 12 and literally still on the cusp of the edge of childhood. I was 14, a mass of raging hormones. I was a short, geeky kid, uh, not into sports. Um, and the last thing I needed or wanted was to have my buddies make fun of me for seeing flying saucers. I also seriously felt that if I ever talked to anybody about this, a girl would find out and then tell another girl and then tell another one. And that caused me over the next few weeks to work very hard to put this out of my mind. And once it was gone, all I can tell you was it never raised its head again. And then here I am, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, but Helen, um, of course, was with me. And I thought, okay, um, I was very shaken up. Um, I, I realized that it had happened. I'm there in my loft in Chinatown. So wait, uh, you, I just want to make sure. So you had this memory in 1975, I think you said. Yes. And it, it had been uh, from uh, years before in the 60s, I'm guessing. 14 and a half years earlier, right. as we can calculate, yes. Or, yeah, all right. So... Um, so is that what triggered it, or was it the realization that your sister had additional experiences? Well, it was a combination, and it went like this. Um, as I tried to pull myself together, because I thought I must be going insane, my logic being, how could anybody ever forget this? It made no sense to me, and that's the way it is sometimes in life. Sadly, often with more conventional trauma, sexual abuse, or what have you. And I thought, okay, okay, I can validate this by calling Helen. Um, she lived a mile or so north of me in the East ah. Village, struggling poet at the time, and I did just that. I called her. However, I had enough foresight when I got her on the phone to say a memory from childhood has returned to me that I think you share. And I could just tell you what it is, and you'll tell me yes or no, but I'm concerned that if I do, you'll say yes or no, and I will never really know in my heart whether you had that same memory. So let me set the scene. And what I started to talk about, Richard, was the time of day, where we were standing on the front lawn um, in proximity to each other, uh, what the weather was like, and she stopped me mid-sentence and said, stop, I know what you're talking about. I said, what? And she told me exactly what I remembered, except she wasn't sure whether it was five or six, which caused me that very afternoon to do a painting of six of them, knowing that I could show it to her the next day and cover the sixth one and then uncover it and say, what do you remember? And it, being that it was an even V, she remembered, agreed that it was five. And in that moment, I basically went, oh my God, they're real oh my God, they're real. And then she right. said, basically, but there's more, and I don't know if you're going to like it. Bear in mind, this is 1975. The only inkling in popular culture about the so-called abduction phenomena is um, the Betty and Barney Hill case, which happened in 61, but became public knowledge in 65. I could have cared less about it. But I'm sure I had some awareness of it from you no know, abductions. Like abductions or were uh, abductions were definitely not in the public uh, perception right. al almost at all. Right, and the ubiquitous beings that we now, oh, even if you're not into the subject, most people know that when you say grays, you're not talking necessarily about a shade between black and white. Um, and Helen started to tell me that she remembered when I started to run. That's how peak my anxiety was after several minutes, which is forever in a situation like that and double forever if you're a kid. I knew what I was doing and she knew what I was doing, which is running into the house to tell our mom, who in fact was in the kitchen making lunch for us. And I was either knocked out or passed out or made to be unconscious. I woke up. I had thought a few minutes later it might have been considerably longer, but I remember going upstairs before going into the kitchen and Helen was in her bedroom looking out the back window with her back to me. I left her alone, talked to my mom, went to the library, got some UFO books for the first and last time in my life, which I hated because they were all from Mars, Venus, all this stuff I didn't want it to be. 
anyway, she said, but there's more and you're not going to like it um, or words to that effect and proceeded to tell me a series of memories. These were not recovered in hypnosis. These were clear memories she had never forgotten. Not a day had passed in her life where she didn't reflect on this one point or another. And I'll tell you why we never talked about it until that afternoon, as far as I know. But they were memories um, that I had never heard anything like in my life. And now I have heard things that are so close, sometimes word for word, hundreds Hundreds well, of Peter, times here and abroad. So what um, did what did she actually tell you she, she remembered? Yes, what, what she recalled was <clears throat> seeing me go down and then lifting off the ground. She Her hair was fairly long at the time. She described the feeling of it blowing. And once again, no fear, no anxiety, just curiosity and interest that she could now see the top of our house for the first time, getting smaller, look up, see the bottoms of these things getting bigger. And the next thing she knew, she was being walked through a curved metal hallway by a number of beings that she described in her 12-year-old language as little doctors with big heads and big eyes who talked to me in my head and one very large one. The next memory was being on a metal table with no clothes on, with these beings clustered around and hearing in her head at different points, we've seen you before, we'll see you again, you're special, we love you, we won't hurt you. Part of um, what became a conflict for her about the experience was at a moment when the voice in her head said, we love you, we won't hurt you. She was experiencing very definite pain from whatever procedure they were doing at that moment, which um, I think she carried with her in many ways uh, for the rest of her life. Uh, we lost Helen in January yeah. of 2000. But it may well have in informed her art um, and the wonderfully in-your-face pose. Oh, yeah that she took as a performer, uh, Peter, a contributing factor. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're about to hit a break in uh, just a, a minute or two, but I just wanted to make sure that I understood. So her, what she appeared to remember was uh, this, this experience, and this was in conjunction with the sighting that the two of you had together, or was this yes. in addition to it? It, so, it literally, um, and she explored this at more length with Bud Hopkins in regressive hypnosis, but yes, um, it was part of... It was the second part. Yeah. There was the sighting, and then up she went. And that's just incredible. And um, I'm sorry I never got to meet Helen, unfortunately. Oh, you and me both. You well, guys would have adored each other. I'm sure. But um, <laughs> the thing was, but she had um, a series of other experiences. I mean, other yeah. abduction experiences in addition to that. So I wonder if we can, we've got like a minute or so before we've got to hit break here. Can you just describe, so was this a series of like reproductive tests that they did with her or what else was going on with her? Well, she wasn't looking down. You know, she was looking up at their faces. Um, right. So there was never any description of the instrumentation, although um, the tr three drawings that I forwarded to you last night, um, she had done while she was working with Bud. Her take on the uh, the event overall was basically, you didn't have my permission to do this, and um, yeah. that's not okay. Yeah, that's really but, it's yeah, extraordinary. These were memories that were not recovered. Uh, other memories were. These were memories she simply had never forgotten. Really amazing. And uh, also, I mean, those those drawings you're referring to, which I'm, I'm looking at them, mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder if there's a way that we can get these posted. They're really extraordinary. So you've got one picture of her, uh, presumably with long hair. She's she's as short as one of the gray she's standing next to. Yeah. And then there's a taller, uh, clear like a gray being with it. its uh, hand on the leader her. one. Yes. Yeah, like as if almost like protective of her. It yeah. looks like to me in this picture. And then there's another one of her on a table, yes. and she her hair is. Very long, and it's like down. It's draped down off the end of the table. And there's um, about nine grays uh, hovering over her. Yeah. it's uh, Actually, it's very arresting as an image, and definitely creepy as well. Yeah. 
It is. So uh, these are the type, types of drawings, and they're really um, very, very striking. And then the yeah. last one, of uh, her third one, she's got a drawing of the small grays, the large one behind them, with a lot of uh, personal description, that the yes. tall one was about six feet tall, communicated by telepathy, um, seemed to move by gliding, showed me around the control room, let me sit in the star chair, um, Really quite quite extraordinary and detailed. And yeah, you're right, like classic, uh, the exact type of description that we so often get with other people who've had these yeah. types of abduction experiences. Uh, so that's easy to see why it would trigger your interest in this phenomenon. Look, let's just take a quick, a quick break, Peter, and yep. we can come back. Uh, I'm Richard Dolan here on The Richard Dolan Show. I'm with my, my guest and friend, Peter Robbins on KGRA. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Richard Dolan here with my friend and guest, Peter Robbins. We're talking about, well, Peter's uh, interests in UFOs, his life. Uh, we were just talking about your sister, Peter, and I think there were a few things you wanted to wrap up regarding Helen. Yeah. Um, first to say that although the account that Helen gave me was all but unheard of 42 years ago, 43 years ago, and that afternoon she told me, the afternoon I remembered the event, um, for me, it was unlike anything I had ever heard before. Uh, my sister and I were particularly close. Uh, we watched out for each other as kids, uh, fairly close in age and very much as adults. Uh, we were both writers. We edited each other's stuff, uh, dated each other's friends, had our adventures together. Mm-hmm. We were dear friends as well as uh, a sister and brother. The one thing I am as sure of as I can possibly be is Helen was not lying. She was giving me her memories as she understood them, which threw my life into um, a certain chaos in that moment. People say, oh, my life changed overnight. Mine changed in about 60 seconds. Um, I had the great good fortune of knowing what I wanted to do as a kid and having the opportunity through wonderful parents and encouraging grandparents and going to the best art school in America at an extraordinary moment in time in the art world and New York. Um, And all of a sudden, there was something more compelling, something more important, something uh, that I became immediately obsessed with. And I resented the hell out of it. I continued to paint. Um, I continued to show my work. I taught for a number of years after that. Um, But I knew I was faking it on a certain degree. Um, My work changed that day. Uh, It went from what it had been to this obsession with discs and disc-shaped objects, uh, some of them very technical, some of them almost cartoon-like, ending up in a series of, of years of work of using little tanks, as allegories for man's fear of the unknown and these UFOs for the unknown. But um, more and more, I was drifting into this work. Why didn't we talk about it all those years if my sister never forgot it? Well, um, again, my anxiety that afternoon about the subject and wanting it in every way possible not to be, not to have happened, to be explainable in conventional terms, was running my life that afternoon, to put it mildly. And late that afternoon, Helen came up to me, either in my bedroom or in the living room or something, and said, do you want to talk about this? And as she reminded me, I looked at her and I said, no. Wow. And then she said, on this phone call, this initial phone call, you know, you're my brother, I love you, I respect you. And so we didn't that day or that week, or that month, or the next year, or any of the years in between. But I never forgot it. How remarkable. It's so interesting to me, uh, hearing this story so completely, from the first time, um, how this phenomenon affects people at the most deep emotional point in their being. And everyone gets affected a little differently in various ways, but everyone shares this commonality that it just it can change your life and change your <laughs> emotional disposition about so many things in your case yes. your very calling in life yes was transformed it's true by this knowledge it's and true. and i just feel personally it's uh it's more than a shame it's 
it's it's more than wrong. It's almost criminal that so many people in this world are constrained from talking about or exploring uh, their experience because they're afraid of the ridicule. So you've got this incredibly powerful moment in your life that happens, right? And yes. who do you talk to about about it? Almost nobody. In so many cases, people have these experiences and they just uh, file them away in some part of their mind and sometimes try to forget them, but they can yeah. never quite forget about it. And in your case, you didn't forget about it. You worked it, but it and it transformed you, but still it affected you deeply. And I'm sure there were so many times where you wanted to explore this more and more with your sister um, and just somehow it didn't happen, right? Well, um, we did explore it yeah. once again after that life-changing afternoon. Right. Yes. Um, we ultimately, um, she worked with uh, Bud Hopkins and, and the great detective Sergeant Pete Mazzola, uh, pioneer New York City police detective trained in criminal uh, hypnotic regression for criminal investigation and a crack UFO investigator. I, um, once I was ready, um, at my own request, Quest was uh, underwent regressive hypnosis on three different occasions with three different individuals. First, uh -huh. and my reason was once I started to learn more about the phenomena, and once I started to work with Bud, certainly, um, and we met the following uh, year, 1976, as two painters interested in this subject, neither of whom had published. Um, we did our very first talk together. Uh, on the, uh, uh, the auditorium of the School of Visual Arts in 76 or 77, where I was teaching. And it was still five years before Bud published Missing Time, the seminal right. book that kind of busted this open. But um, with Helen, um, we talked about it more and more. Um, my, my interest at that point, a year or so into it, was could this have happened to me in that that is something that I also don't remember or don't remember that yet. And um, so you went through a regression and did not, you did not find an abduction experience in those memories. I went through three different regressions. Um, one with a, uh, an old friend of mine who happened to have just received his uh, accreditations as a hypnotist, then with Bud, then with Pete Mazzola. And I think now, um, and I am convinced nothing did happen to me. One of the patterns that we see is in siblings or husbands and wives or a friend and a friend, uh, whatever, um, uh, that one person is the person of interest and the other one is shut off. Yeah. Um, in my case, the many years that I worked with Bud face to face um, with people who seem to have gone through this to the number of several hundred and sat in on more hypnotic regressions as a witness at the request of the individual and Bud, then I actually remember right now more um, knowing that part of the profile is a very complex, um, multi-numbered uh, list of quirky phobias and strange, unexplained behaviors, everything from pathological fear of going to the dentist to staring at two fried eggs you know, in a frying pan to a beautiful little place in the woods that you don't want to go near, you know, uh, on the pain of death. But it's a long list. And nothing in all the years I worked with Bud rattled anything loose. In fact, um, nothing. Uh, after all of these years, yes, I am convinced that I was not abducted and that was my sister was the person of interest yeah. and um life went on from there well this this triggered your your, your new life it's not your new life anymore but it triggered <laughs> a, a fascinating interest um another interesting thing that you've explored over the years and again we've talked about this many times mm. is um the career and uh, philosophy of wilhelm reich yes. and you, you've talked a lot about reich and i think you know there are folks out there who know who reich was I think there's a lot who don't know. Uh, I'll just I'll just jump in and, and say Reich was, um, you know, one of the early um, pioneer psychologists of the 20th century. Psychiatrists. Uh, psychiatrists. Well, psychologists and psychiatrists. I I would actually hazard to say, but um, <laughs> who had very original ideas. He was uh, initially, I think, a, a student of Freud, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he's a, a close assistant to Freud. To Freud. For yeah. Exactly. Six years, yeah. And, and then, you know, like a number of Freud's other colleagues, like Jung and others, went off and really founded his own, his own path. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Reich was also interested in UFOs, and Reich had a lot of interesting things, and you've been studying him for a while, and I just wonder if you'd like to tell people a little bit about why Reich is important and what is the significant in the um, significance in the world of UFOs. Yeah. Um, yes, I have studied Reich's work for quite a while since I was a teenager. A um, uh, college roommate came back from a vacation and said, you've got to read this, uh, and handed me this big, fat book called Character Analysis, uh, one of the most important books, uh, I think, available to uh, students in the mental health profession. Um, I read about a third of it and realized I was in over my head, but it got me to begin reading Dr. Reich's work. Um, I knew once I started to subscribe to the Journal of Organomy, Organomy being the name that he gave to the science that he established, which is basically the science of how energy functions in the living and non-living realm uh, of, natural, uh, of nature. And I, I, I understood that he had had you know, this interest in UFOs, but once again, I had no interest in that until 1975, when I had read quite a bit of his work, felt that he was a true millennial genius, um, and still do, that his writings have helped and guided me in my understanding of why humanity is in such a miserable state and why the world, uh, as an expanded uh, vision of individuals, uh, whether it's governments um, or, or large groups of people, political movements, um, there's so much frustration. There's so much unresolved anxiety. There's so much sadness and people treating each other badly. Um, his work gave me a, a clear scientific understanding and a social philosophy uh, that has guided my life more than any other, I think. And I don't know where I would be without it. Anyway, in um, 1975, this memory returns and I start to find material um, in the literature on Reich and UFOs. I learned that he had no interest on this about the subject before 1953. Um, even though he was an active member of the scientific community in 1947 when this whole uh, subject exploded. I I pulled up a quote here. um, After he read Major Kehoe's uh, uh, book, Flying Saucers from Outer Space, that year, and in his notes, in his diaries, he observed that I had not studied anything on the subject. I knew practically nothing about it. But my mind, used to expecting surprises in natural research, was open to anything that seemed real. And this was about the time in his um, development as a scientist where he was turning his attention away from cancer formation, from human neuroses, from body armoring uh, locked into the musculature that held painful memories in place, and if in a therapeutic setting could be dissolved, uh, that memory could be released and the problem underlying it had a chance of being resolved. Yeah, can I just, I would like to restate that if you don't mind, because it's, no. it's actually a key thing about Reich. He, he had this concept called armoring. Yes. Uh, you're, you know this uh, intimately. Crucially important. And, oh, Reich, Reich followers do, but other people don't necessarily know. And his idea yeah. about armoring is it, it's a form of, uh, I guess you could say psychological protection against, um, I'm just... Uh, giving my own interpretation here, but yes. against traumas that are inflicted against the individual in the course of their life. So you have difficult things that happen to you. You develop armoring, protection, psychological protection, a hardening, as it were. But yes. the, the problem is that this hardening, um, you know, you could argue is, is often sometimes necessary in certain cir- circumstances, but then becomes, uh, it can be destructive and it can prevent you from, from um, other new experiences. And he uh, said furthermore that this hardening took the form of physical, uh, like physical armoring in that you would be, um, your musculature would be tight or not relaxed and you could, you could see it visually in people. Is that more or less an accurate That is statement? fairly accurate, Richard. Yeah. And um, the fact that you've had an opportunity uh, these past two summers to join me at a remarkable pair of conferences um, 
sponsored by the Academy of Orgonomy in Athens, Greece. Uh, some of our favorite people uh, are members and helped to bring us over. Oh, yes. Um, these two conferences um, dealt with orgonomy and Reich studies as well as uh, UFOs. Yes, um, a lot of people get allegorically, you know, a tightening or, you know, you're armored, but it's real. It's actually a physiological fact that most people suffer from, and it becomes chronic uh, to such a degree that your respiration historically changes, uh, your energy is blocked and moving through your body in a natural flowing way, your potential for full sexual happiness is terribly inhibited, um, you deal out of the secondary layer of armoring um, a an area where uh, there's tremendous unresolved mm -hmm. rage. Rage breaking, being deflected by the armoring may come out as sarcasm, but behind it is anger and terrible sadness. Um, and again, Reich developed this extraordinary pioneering therapy um, that is able to dissolve armor under positive conditions and with a committed patient and a good therapist. Um, and this is where things got personal for me. Um, shortly after uh, this breakthrough in memory and starting to connect up the work of this person, their courage in uh, uh, their studies of UFOs. Uh, and at the time, as I was saying before, Reich was starting to turn his attention to the cosmos. Um, and uh, right before that, really the, um, the world, the atmosphere around us, uh, weather modification. And he developed a remarkably simple apparatus uh, that came to be known as the Cloud Buster that properly deployed um, can um, create rain where none existed, which has the potential to break droughts and has repeatedly and well documentedly, although the public is hardly aware of it. For anyone that has even a remote interest, uh, a place to go to learn more about it is um, the website of the Orgone, that's O-R-G-O-N-E, Orgone Biophysical Research Laboratory run by Dr. James DeMeo, um, um, it, just outside of beautiful Ashland, Oregon. Um, Jim, um, in his time as a cloud buster, uh, did more successful work in more locations than even Reich could have dreamt of. But Reich's initial cloud busting experiments in Maine um, attracted UFO activity. Now, for people that already were uh, skittish about him because so much of his published work revolved around healthy sexuality, which, uh, say, for a group like the FDA in the 40s and 50s meant, you know, you're some kind of sex pervert and your machines don't plug into anything, they don't run gasoline, so you're obviously a quack and we've got to destroy you, which they ultimately did. Not the work, but the Well, yeah, man. this is a man who wrote a book called The Function of the Orgasm. So yes, in fact, <laughs> um, the titles... Uh, his, I don't know if anything is in print right now, but you can find almost all of these books online and often for not big prices. The titles of the books themselves um, bespeak a mind well ahead of its time. I'll rattle off a few. Uh, the Bioelectrical Investigation of Sexuality and Anxiety, The Cancer Biopathy, Children of the Future, The Function of the Orgasm, The Impulsive Character, The Invasion of Compulsory Sex Morality a book that a lot of people in this world would love to see burned every single copy. The Mass Psychology of Fascism, The Murder of Christ, People in Trouble. Um, he was extraordinary prolific in his writings and left so much unpublished that we will continue to see new books on Reich be published over time to come as the estate is able to do so. I just want, but, uh, I just yeah. want to add here, yeah, Peter, no, uh, Reich, th there are very few people like Wilhelm Reich in the sense this was a man who you clearly uh, can see, like he just unleashed his mind. And uh, this is a, a man who was obviously exploring everything that he felt was 
worthy of exploration. He was, in that sense, he was utterly fearless. That doesn't even do justice. Yes. Um, yes. And and whether he's right or not, that's a whole other question that people, I guess, can debate about. I think that he, as you think, he had deep insights and uh, wisdom about uh, many facets of the human condition. And he's absolutely worth reading and understanding. I, yeah. I'm, I'm just amazed by the multifaceted uh, power of his mind and his intellect. To me, that's fascinating. And the fact that he was brave enough, among many other things, to delve into the UFO subject as well. Oh, indeed. The problem with the great majority of people debating about this is many people have read things about Reich, but very few people have read anything by Wilhelm Reich, and therein lies all the difference in the world. He's criticized by people that have no understanding of his work for being all over the place. Well, if you follow the trajectory of his scientific work over 35 plus years, you see it line up like a gun sight. Again, it all had to do with how energy functions. And so his early work with Freud and the human condition, moving into how cancer forms, moving into um, healthy babies and healthy mothers, moving into uh, how weather systems manifest themselves uh, and how star systems form the propulsive methods of UFOs, it's all a logical sequence. And in fact, reduced to a basic, elegant, extremely simple formula, um, it's all unified. The formula has to do with everything from how, what happens when a one-celled animal splits into two one-celled animals to um, a fully discharged orga orgasm between two loving human beings, to how a storm forms, to how uh, a star system forms, and it's this. Tension, as in mechanical tension. Discharge, as in electrical discharge. Tension, charge, discharge, and then relaxation, a four-beat formula. Um, so many people in this world who are sexually frustrated especially in the world of men, think, okay, if I get laid more, have more sex, or more people, it'll all work out. It doesn't, because there's always a holding. There's always an inability to trust in the experience, the terror of letting go and being vulnerable. Uh, but that's nature, or block nature, as the case may be. And, and if I can I, just add here, yeah. I, think, I think you're right onto it. And, it's, it's, in other words, it's not the quantity, it's the quality of the experience that is healing, liberating, and actually truly valuable. It's, it's not quantity. In fact, that's just more of a trap, uh, he would it say, is. and I would say that's a trap. So it's all about the quality of the connection you have with this, with another human being. That it is, is but it also that. means that you and that other human being have to have the capacity and the courage and uh, the basically healthy character structure uh, to, you know, to, for it to happen. Uh, and that, sadly, is a rarity in this world. Again, the psychology of um, that one of the most important and most uh, frightening books for people with a rigid character structure or beliefs mystical beliefs that govern their behavior and I've got to be behave a certain way in this life to have, you know, go to heaven in the next, the invasion of compulsory sex morality, the Mark. tragedy of, of humanity on earth in great part has to do with sexual fear, uh, fear of, you know, the afterlife of offending your God. Um, it goes on and on. And, um, Again, to bring this back to a personal point. Well, we're just um, about at the end here. I've got to wrap it up. So okay. make, make your point, and then we'll, uh, then we'll hit the break. Uh, by 1976, I, I learned, much to my shock, that Dr. Reich's first assistant for the last 11 years of his life, a psychiatrist who he charged with continuing the training that he had developed for psychiatrists and physicians to do the work as he had established it, and being a medical orgone therapist, as they're called, is not like being a Reichian therapist. There are probably thousands and thousands of Reichian therapists out there. And in order to be one, 
I believe the uh, the protocols are touch your finger to your nose, turn around three times. You are a Reikian therapist if you say you are. A medical organomist goes through years of overseeing training. They have to be ideally psychiatrists and physicians to understand uh, the forces they may be letting go in the human body and being able to deal with them if things uh, you know, move out of uh, uh, normal control for a layperson. But um, I found out Dr. Baker was alive and I made it my business to meet him. It took me six calls and I showed up at his office on the Upper East Side that afternoon with a little envelope full of UFO research. I was quite a, an authority. I had been in the work for a year already, so I knew pretty much everything. <laughs> and that afternoon <laughs> changed my life. Um, I went into therapy with Dr. Baker, who had been Reich's assistant and who had been in therapy with Reich and stayed in therapy with him for almost seven years. Uh, I think, again, it was one of the most important experiences of my life, has helped me more than I can even appreciate at times to make my way through high anxiety situations and be there for other people and be there for myself. But um, with Dr. Baker, I got to meet so many of the people who knew Reich, uh, interview them extensively and put together a better understanding of who he was as a person and, again, understand more about how his courage and to a degree naivete uh, in publishing his observations, findings, and conclusions about the UFO phenomena helped naysayers, the frightened scientific world, and skeptics all over to crucify him and destroy him uh, as an individual, which they were very successful in doing. Yeah. Well, Peter, uh, just a fascinating, I, I think, <clears throat> you know, your interest in Reich really does inform a very large part of, of your mission in this field, and I'm glad you had a chance to talk about it. Uh, let's take a quick break, and we're going to come back. I'd love to talk with you about a very strong mutual interest of ours, and that's uh, late former Secretary of Defense of the United States, James Forrester. We'll be right back. I'm Richard Dolan here with Peter Robbins on KGRA. This is The Richard Dolan Show. I'm back. This is Richard Dolan. I'm here with Peter Robbins. Uh, we're talking about, well, Peter's research, pretty much everything. We talked about his uh, sister, Helen Robbins, a.k.a. Helen Wheels, punk rocker, rock star legend, who had abduction experiences after their own mutual UFO sighting when they were kids. Fascinating. Uh, we talked about Peter's interest in uh, Orgone and Wilhelm Reich. And um, my God, yeah, we could have just talked for hours about that. But mm. I want to I ask you, Peter, about James Forrest. So when we first met in 2002, that, that was actually something we both discovered. Ah, we <laughs> both were interested in that. And yes. you talked a little bit. I talked a little bit. Um, I, I'll just start by saying I, uh, Forrestal was one of my first entry points into the UFO mystery, if I can even put it that way. Yeah. When I studied the death of James Forrestal, which was uh, he f fell, jumped, thrown uh, out of the 16th floor of the Bethesda Naval Hospital in um, Maryland in 1949. I mean, that man was murdered. Yes. And I always have seen that in conjunction in one way or another with the UFO phenomenon and the UFO cover-up. That's always been my opinion. I don't know that for a fact, but I do feel very confident in stating that James Forrestal, our first Secretary of Defense, was murdered. Yes. And, uh, you know, officially, of course, his death was ruled a suicide. But you have also studied Forrestal. And um, I'm just curious what your, what your own take on Forrestal is, what, you, what insights you have at this point. You know, on the life and death of James Forrestal. Yeah, I, I should say first that I remember that first conversation we had about Forrestal in Rochester uh, 15 years ago or so. And at that time, I was already 15 years into my fascination with his life and the circumstances surrounding his death. Um, it was triggered for me um, in the summer of 1987, when the initial eight page, we call it the Eisenhower briefing document, uh, which I feel is very uh, authentic after a lot of study and consideration as opposed to many other bits of paperwork, uh, documents that have come up purporting to be from this uh, legendary study group uh, around Truman. Um, it 
broke that summer, and I managed to get a copy of it a month or so before it broke big, and it was the talk of um, that year's International MUFON Symposium, which was marking the 40th year of Roswell, Kenneth Arnold, the birth of the modern age of UFOs, and that was um, when I first got to make some contact with Stanton Friedman, who did a brilliant paper on the secret life of Donald K. Menzel. And when I got back to New York, uh, I was going over the document. I see there's Forrestal's name and other names that I had become vaguely aware of, some I wasn't. And I realized that I wanted to do research into one of them. I've been quite inspired by Stan's extraordinary uh, research paper that he gave. It was a turning point for me and wanting to be more serious in the work and commit myself on a deeper level. And of all people, I was talking to my late great mother about it and going over the individuals. And there's me and my mom going down the list of MJ-12 members. And she said, do Forrestal. I thought, okay, why do you think I should do that? She said, first, you can't imagine how, how important he was to us during the war, how, what a central figure he was right up there with Truman, and how when we all learned that he had killed himself because of the stress that he experienced during the war and who knows what else, it was for me as a young woman, maybe close to what you went through as, as a boy when, when John Kennedy was killed. And then she's quiet for me and she said, also, I had a crush on him. <laughs> yeah. He was he was a handsome guy. I'll just for, you, you, I'll he's just He's a add. very handsome guy. Yeah. He was charismatic. He was an amazing dresser. And I thought, you know what? That's it. I've decided. And so I began to read the literature and buy the out-of-print memoirs yeah. and pick up a old copy of the Forrestal Diaries, um, what was published, a tiny fraction, and um, apply myself as an investigator more than I ever had uh, with that little attorney that lives in uh, the left side of all of our brains and build a case that I hope that I could make for the fact that foul play was definitely involved and then do my best to deduce the contributing factors. Um, in fact, it's a project that I have picked up and put down for all these years now. And as you know, I am back at it. I am rereading uh, very slowly and carefully what will probably remain as the very best uh, biography on him uh, called Driven Patriot by Townsend Hoops and the great historian Douglas Brinkley. The irony there for me was I knew Townsend Hoops because he was a board member of the repertory theater company that I was a house manager for throughout the 80s. And we had a number of cheerful, superficial conversations at theater openings through the 80s. But it wasn't until several years later that my dear uh, departed friend, um, Sandra Wright, a, a remarkable woman who was also involved in the work and close friends with Lawrence Rockefeller and Marie uh, Galbraith, who were also behind creating that remarkable document for Congress, that she said, oh, I, Townsend's an old friend of mine. And now that he's retired, he's teaching at Georgetown and um, he's very into UFOs. You should speak to him about Forrestal. He knew Forrestal. He worked for him in his first job at the Pentagon. And she cold called him right then and there. Wow. And within a moment, I knew we had a problem. She was speaking to his wife. The conversation lasted a minute and she hung up. She said, God, I haven't spoken to him in a year or so. He is in stage four of uh, a cancer that will kill him. And so I missed my opportunity to speak to the only person I would ever probably know who knew him and worked with him. Uh, be that as it may, um, I'm using it partly as an opportunity to do the most complete presentation that I can on it uh, and the best illustrated one. But as you know, um, I know it's not a primary interest of yours, experimenting with a way that I can reach out to a completely different audience, in this case, in a theatrical kind of, of setting. Uh, as a uh, a two act staged reading, you know, it well, wouldn't be a play. Um, but he continues to fascinate me, and he was murdered. Uh, he had to die because in 1949 he did suffer a truly profound nervous breakdown, and was all too clear in his own mind that as the weak link, 
you read the description, the job description of what the Secretary of Defense does, what their responsibilities are. They are right next to the President of the United States in knowing everything about everything. Yeah, let's just now, set, uh, can I set the stage yeah, a little bit if you don't mind? So Forrestal, in 1947, so the United States had just led the, the victory of World War II, of course. Yes. And uh, the... Which he had contributed to as Secretary of Navy greatly. He, he was, uh, well, yeah, for most of the war, I think he was Assistant Secretary, but he really right. ran the Navy. And then at the end of the war became actual Secretary of the Navy. And yep. he was, as your mom was saying a uh, very much a celebrity as well as a top level government official it was very in- interesting about him uh, you once described him as like a real life Jay Gatsby yes yeah but the thing is Forrestal was also then be the first secretary of the newly formed Defense Department in 1947 when that whole reorganization took place so he was and he had to manage the air the new Air Force the Army and the Navy and um, what happened with Forrestal is through 1948, uh, friends started to see him sort of dissolve, as it were, mentally. He became very tightly wound, even more than before, um, developed all of these nervous tics and habits and started talking about being followed by foreign-looking men. That was part of it. He had a lot of enemies in Washington, for sure. Yeah. But he also became ultra-paranoid, it seemed. And uh, then... Kind of, uh, I just want to say this part too, became uh, from what I read, I read uh, Hoops and Brinkley's book too and um, indicated that like during the campaign of 1948, Truman ran against Thomas Dewey, the Republican. Forrestal seemed to be very sympathetic to Dewey (laughs) and uh, I don't think Truman took kindly to that. The word got out that Forrestal had met with Dewey during the campaign and that's often given as the main reason Truman decided to fire him after he got reelected in 1948. Um, but then what happened with Forrestal is that you know, at the same time, you've got this UFO phenomenon, flying saucers, exploding yeah. within the U.S. defense establishment and in the public. And Forrestal was a key person and I think, as you're saying, was not necessarily considered reliable anymore. And so yeah, I, they, they, I, they took care of that. For me, he is the classic example of that old phrase, you don't have to be a paranoid to know that someone is following you. In his case, it was genuine. There was a tremendous jealousy uh, generated around him. And I think the turning point, as far as the break with Truman, which absolutely shattered him, uh, he was nothing if not a loyal, patriotic American. And uh, the kind of people we don't see in government sadly anymore as far as I'm concerned. A terrific team player who put country ahead of self wherever it was. He was the first, now of course, in, as we come into a presidential election, it is understood that you have to have teams in place ready to interface for a change of command. That was not the way it was in 1948. He was the first one to put forward, in this case, to a then future Secretary of Defense, Robert Lovett, that given that it looked good that Truman might not win, shouldn't they have, you know, some protocols in place to make the transition of power fairly smooth, which was all that a number of people who wanted him brought down uh, did. Also, as you and I know, uh, there's something so exciting in historic research about timelines. Uh, At times you say to yourself, my God, I couldn't be, you know, this is more exciting than anything I could make up in a screenplay. Um, The phenomena kicks in uh, June 24th officially of 1947 with Kenneth Arnold. A week later, something goes down in the plains of San Augustin outside of a town, well outside of a town called Roswell, New Mexico, home of the only nuclear strike force in the world, uh, 509th bomb wing. Forrestal is nominated Uh, shortly thereafter, for this new position for an entity that he oversaw the creation of. Uh, At the end of the war, Truman went to him, not a group of people, and said, dismantle the old War Department we've had in place since the American Revolution and create something we're going to call the Department of Defense, which he did, and kept his wits about him with the infighting and uh, all of the people coming at him from the different service branches concerned about the power that they'd have. He is sworn in. Um, on September 18th, as I recall, but the swearing in is very sudden. 
And in fact, uh, as part of the presentation I do, I, I cite the newspaper headlines and uh, Henry Wallace, who was a, uh, a candidate for president and somebody uh, not a fan of, of Truman's at that point. Truman orders the swearing in, returning from a state visit to Brazil aboard an American battleship, saying it has to be done that afternoon. And immediately, the newspapers and the media, uh, led by uh, Wallace, are saying, What's the emergency? Why is this happening now? Why does it have to happen now? That is the same date as the MJ-12 document. And even if one wants to dismiss it immediately and totally, it's like three days before the Twinings memo, which is guilt-edged and discusses the fact that the phenomena um, is something real and not visionary or right. fictitious. The timing is extraordinary. And he had a character flaw, bless his heart, which was that he internalized all of his successes and failures and personalized them. It wasn't the kind of thing where a bad day at the office, you know, things went bad for, you know, me as head of the Department of Defense. It ate him up alive, and he was not able to share it, even with his closest friends, who he kept at that point more and more at uh, hand's distance. The circumstances, of course, surrounding his actual death are beyond suspicious. I mean, it's murder, folks. And it's um, it's absolutely fascinating for me. It's the highest level of Greek tragedy, uh, one well, of certainly in American history that is classically the form of a Greek tragedy. With about he, uh, 10 he minutes, He knew he Peter? had to die. He Could tried to kill himself several times before he was institutionalized and then began to respond to therapy and develop a will right. to live again, and somebody had to finish it for him. Could you describe uh, the circumstances of Forrestal's death and, and why they are so suspicious? Yeah. Um, the official accounts vary slightly, but basically um, he was uh, set to be discharged on Sunday, May 22nd. Um, the hospital records that we have seen um, all of the remarks by the people who had come to visit him and the hospital staff and his doctors was that he was getting better. He was gaining weight. His appetite was back. He was taking uh, care of his appearance again. His brother Henry uh, had arranged for him to complete his recovery on the state of a friend privately. Um, it was all going to happen. He was being released on uh, that Sunday, uh, the 22nd. Meanwhile, um, he had a series of three Marine guards who were at his door in eight-hour shifts from the moment he got into the hospital until the final night. The final night, the guard that he had become closest to, a young Marine who had come to think of him very much as a father and who Forrestal ob obviously had real affection for. And I, my readings indicate that, you know, once he got out that he might find a job for him or a place in his life, whatever, he didn't show up that night. Uh, the myth, the rumor was he got drunk. This is not that kind of person, but uh, we have a hospital attendant uh, who may have been a dupe. I'm not saying he was, you know, a, a dark player, but that, you know, he was the Oswald, he was the wrong guy. And allegedly, um, he comes in to check on him 1.30 that morning, um, seems to be uh, sleep goes back five minutes later, Forrestal is up. And allegedly, and I say allegedly, because I have read that there is some um, discrepancy about the handwriting of the famous uh, Sophocles poem that he was copying out of a poetry anthology edited by, I think, then poet laureate of the United States, Mark Van Doren. Um, and if it's true, we have a very intriguing detail here uh, that he stops writing mid word. He's writing the word nightingale and he stops at night. There are only several scenarios that would present themselves, I think, to a logical person about why you stop in the middle of a word when you're involved in a chosen intellectual exercise, a moment. He was quite a scholar and well-read. And, you know, my first thought is... Well, I, I mean, if I may, I don't know if that well, was explained, <laughs> um, because what actually happened, the, the guard, because I, I know the story as well, and the guard claimed that 
Um, he checked on Forrestal. Uh, he found that Forrestal was up transcribing something in his journal, like late at night, one thirty in the morning. Uh, asked Forrestal if he wanted a I sedative. Think a stationer. Right. Wanted Forrestal if he wanted a sedative. Forrestal said no. Yeah. He left. Fifteen main, minutes later, he comes back to check. Forrestal's Ooh. gone. They discover he's run out the room, gone out the window, (laughs) jumped to his death. What you're referring to is that Forrestal had not only stopped his transcription in the middle of a sentence, but he had actually stopped his transcription in the middle of a word. He had. And then then suddenly decided in the middle of writing the word Nightingale, he stops in the middle of it and decides, I'm going to kill myself. And then stopped and then jumps out the window. Even though yeah. everyone from his doctors to the hospital transcriptions to the people that he spoke to, to the president, to a Lewis K. Johnson, the second secretary of defense who had come to visit him, et cetera, all said he was recovering well. The other detail is that Harbison, um, the hospital attendant, allegedly forgot to lock the door. And in that moment where he goes from being, one can assume, anticipating being let out of this institution after six weeks of essentially being in prison, that, whoa, in a split second, he decides, no, I'm suicidally depressed and I need to not just jump out the window, but tie my bathrobe sash cord very tightly around my neck first, then lower myself out the window then maybe change my mind because we have it from not my research, but the key investigative researcher who led the New York Times investigation that there were scratch marks on the window jam outside indicating somebody trying not to fall. Uh, The Navy had first theorized that the other end of the bathrobe sash had been tied to the radiator below the window, but they dismissed that in their cursory examination. And the answer that I've gotten, and you'd be amazed at how many mental health professionals I have asked over the decades about this, especially during the eight years I worked as a volunteer and a shift supervisor uh, on the busiest suicide hotline in America, uh, Samaritan's International Office in New York, about this scenario of hanging yourself out a window. And Uniformly, um, every psychologist, psychiatrist, psychiatric social worker I have queried about this has said, jumpers jump and people don't want to hang themselves, hang themselves. Never have I encountered or even thought about, you know, uh, a case where the twain shall meet. Um, yeah. We've got about four minutes here, yeah. uh, three or four yeah. minutes. So is there uh, final final things you just want to say to wrap up about Forcel? I don't want to have you cut yourself off before yeah. the break. Um, this was a driven man. Grew up in a small town in upstate New York, wanted to be a success, Uh, got into Dartmouth, got into Plymouth, uh, (laughs) got into um, um, uh, Princeton, uh, joined the um, uh, Air Corps, the Naval Air Corps to fight in World War I, precluded by the end of secessions, went on Wall Street to become a millionaire, married a very glamorous woman um, in a marriage that was immediately troubled by his infidelities and returned after a while by her, but a man who loved his country, who was a true patriot, not in the way the word is often bandied about these days, and who put his life on hold when the president of the United States asked him to come to Washington for one dollar a year and help get this country out of the depression as a member of the so-called dollar a year men, kitchen cabinet, business leaders who were patriots and who did this. Unlike them, though, he never returned to making money. He stayed in Washington, served in his capacities in the United States Navy, literally created uh, our new modern defense uh, department, served with as much distinction as he could in bringing us into uh, through the darkest moments of the early Cold War and was a casualty, certainly. Part of the reason that he ended up having his breakdown was nothing he could do or affect helped us one iota to get one step closer to wrapping our military intelligence heads 
around this anomalous phenomena and their intentions. And if it had been another person, okay, I'm doing my best, but hey, what's for dinner and let's go out to the club tonight for drinks? It literally ate him up inside. He should be seen as the American hero that he is and his memory should be resurrected and respected. Well, uh, I'm glad to hear you say all of this about Forrestal. I feel that um, it really comes down to why was he murdered, not was he murdered. And, I mean, yeah. even just getting to the point of having a, a widespread acknowledgement that, that he was thrown out that window. Oh, yeah. I, I think I, I once um, I mentioned to you, because uh, I wrote in my first book, uh, UFOs in the National Security State, the first volume, I, I covered Forrestal's death, which I also described as uh, oh, a virtually certain murder. And I described, the, I mentioned the name of the, the new guard that was posted that night on the midnight shift, uh, Robert Harrison, I believe. In. Yeah. So after that book had been out for a few years, a, a, a descendant or yes. a, oh, of remember. Robert Harrison wrote to me. And Good. he was, you know, I guess I should say none too pleased that I had yeah. mentioned this. I mean, I didn't, I didn't state that the new guy threw Forrestal out the window. I mean, it may not have been him. You although tied his name. I did. I mean, he would have been a 25-year-old, big, tough yeah. Navy corpsman. I'm sure Forrestal, uh, by that point in his life, would not have been able to offer any resistance. Um, but it could easily have been, as you say, he could have been a dupe. Uh, there could have been another team of assassins that came in very quickly and although, I mean, from what I could gather of the layout of that floor, it would have been hard to get in there without, without the security guard seeing or knowing, oh, in no. my opinion. So there is definitely something going on here. One other thing I'll just mention is in the, uh, the investigation which, of this, which is known as the Willicuts investigation. And yes. you've got a copy of it and I've got a copy yes. of it. Anyone can download the PDF. One of the things that uh, people should notice is that uh, they have transcripts of the interviews of, of all the people involved. Yeah. And, in, and that includes uh, an interview of, of Harrison himself, the guard, yeah. which by my uh, reading of it could not have taken more than 10 minutes of uh, just yeah. questioning very briefly. Did, you know, you have any other things to add about this? No, sirs, I do not. Okay, well, you're free to go. I mean, there was no, no yeah. actual investigation of his, of his role. I mean, he was the guy on the scene. He was the new guard, and no one really questioned this. This is 1949, 14 years before Kennedy was yeah. taken out. So I yeah. think they just thought they could get away with it. I think so. And um, the one thing that um, I stumbled on uh, when I finally uh, began to read the Willicott's file was a series of fairly innocuous photographs, two of the room where uh, he had lived for six weeks, allegedly taken, you know, uh, within hours of the uh, uh, the suicide, quote unquote. And of course, it looked like nothing had ever happened there. It was a perfectly made up room, a view of the window that he went out of, which in context is a very poignant photo. And then the one that surprised us both of a broken glass on yeah. the carpet of That's the right. floor of his room, which I've continued to blow up and study and try to make deductions about. Um that photo in itself is fairly telling of uh, an action that may have taken place in that room and then innocuously photoed, uh, photographed by the naval photographer who was ordered in to take some stock shots. Um, that just leaves us wanting more information and wondering about the fate of this remarkable American. Exactly. Why was that piece of broken glass in that room at that time? Mm. doesn't make any sense. Well, listen, we're at the, uh, the the bottom of the hour. We have one segment to go. Peter, I'd love to have you back for one more uh, segment. I'm Richard Dolan. This is the Richard Dolan Show on KGRA. Don't go away. Welcome back. I'm Richard Dolan here with my friend and colleague, Peter Robbins. We're just having a very interesting conversation here about a number of uh, areas related to Peter's research. And uh, Peter, I just want to ask you now, uh, you've got a couple of things going up where you will be appearing. Uh, if you want to give a plug for that, talk about anything that's coming up with you. Yeah. Um, my next talk is, um, it's very special to me because it's at a library, and I love libraries, and I love books, and I think they're both endangered species. Um, support your local library folks, and in this case, the library uh, that I'll be speaking at on Saturday, June 9th, from 2.30 to 4 in the afternoon is the Olean Public Library, O-L-E-A-N, outside of Buffalo, New York. 
So if you are in the area, please join me. There's no cost, and it will be a uh, rather freewheeling, very well-illustrated talk with an audience that is not cued into the subject of UFOs, which I always appreciate. Peter, is there a website where people can learn about this? Yes, uh, the oleanpubliclibrary.org. Um, they uh, sound like a very together library, and um, I was approached by uh, the head of uh, uh, outreach services, basically, after uh, she had read uh, an interview with me that appeared in a uh, local publication here a month or so ago. Oh, I see here. It's oleanlibrary.org. It was close. And um, indeed, they have a link uh, toward for your upcoming event. So that's June 9th. And uh, Olean's not too far from where I am here in Rochester. Anyway, that's cool. that's great. And um, you and I also have, have done the, <laughs> we've also done the Pine Bush New York event, but I yes. won't be there and you won't be there this year. No, um, I was scheduled to uh, be a speaker and to MC it. But as we know, um, it was canceled and rescheduled due to that terrible storm that hit there right before. And unfortunately, the day re they rescheduled it too was the one day uh, this coming month that I have an obligation and having had to change it once, it, it was not appropriate to change it again. Uh, if you can get to the Pine Bush uh, UFO uh, Fair and Conference, you will have a great time and have a great conference as well as a lot of fun. And then you and I will be uh, together in Exeter, New Hampshire in the very beginning of uh, September. Certainly will. One of our For, favorite conferences. And, and that's um, actually what, really one of the one of the most interesting East Coast uh, UFO events of the year, Ex the Exeter UFO Festival in Exeter, New Hampshire. And, um, I, I agree, and I yeah. take great pride in the fact of having been a co-founder of that event. And the thing, one of the things that distinguishes it, besides being in one, one of the most archetypically beautiful New England towns you've ever seen, a real Courier and Ives. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, center in town, is that above and beyond um, their expenses in creating the event and uh, giving honorariums to the speakers, all profits go to support children's services in the greater Exeter area. So everybody wins, and it's a point of great pride for you and I and all of our colleagues that uh, have the honor to be part of it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So that'll be that'll be great to be there with you for that. Um, so onward and upward, we've um, got one other thing that I would love to chat with you here. And uh, this is something that you did way back in 1978 with our mutual friend Antonio Huneas. Yeah. Who's a longtime UFO researcher from Chile. He lives in the U.S. now. Um, and a man that I never met, but you got to know, Coleman von Kavitsky. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about this? I mean, set the stage. 1978 was the year that the UFOs were being discussed in the United Nations. A lot of people don't realize this. It was a very big year. There was a, uh, the Prime Minister of Grenada, Sir Edward Gary, had seen a UFO in the early years and was obsessed with it. And he yes. made it his mission to bring UFOs into the topic uh, of the floor of the United Nations. The U.S. and U.K. basically eventually shot the whole thing down, but not before sure. he made a big stir and got a lot of American ufologists in, involved in giving testimony. And, um, and apparently Coleman von Kavitsky got involved, and he, he was not American. He's Hungarian. If you could talk a little bit about him. Yeah. Um, first, um, Prime Minister Gary had had this bee in his bonnet for some years and had been pushing away to try to get... Uh, the General Assembly to approve a resolution to establish nothing more than a permanent committee to study the UFO phenomena. Ultimately, his dream was to develop a database for countries to share information, all leading to what we might today term disclosure. Uh, he was a visionary and, again, being the head of a very small country, who had interest in other paranormal subjects, heaven forbid, uh, was, you know, I'm sure had a little fun made of him behind his back. Where I came into the picture, already knowing a little of my timeline, um, I was still fairly new in the work, but I had already been fortunate enough to meet the three men who would be my mentors, um, the best known being Bud Hopkins, uh, then New York City Detective Police Sergeant uh, um, Pete Mazzola, 
who was the person who introduced me to um, Coleman von Kivetsky. Coleman was a naturalized American citizen uh, of Hungarian descent who during World War II, um, before the war, he was a film director in Hungary. During World War II, he was a staff officer in charge of all photo reconnaissance and photo analysis for the Hungarian military during World War II. Um, luckily, he was able to uh, get out of Hungary in the final days of the war with his young son, uh, infant son and wife, escaped to the American lines, then spent seven years in West Germany working for an organization to help repatriate uh, primarily Jewish refugees and connect them up where possible uh, and reunite them with relatives, although in many cases that was not possible. He emigrated to the States in 1952 very shortly before the very famous UFO overflights over Washington, D.C. and the world-shaking photos of uh, the images that we are, most of us are familiar with of this strategic uh, formation of UFOs uh, photographed over the Capitol building, viewed by thousands of people, radar returns, etc. And that was it for him. He, he got involved in the work. Okay. But as a military scientist, and I met him in 78 or 77, uh, he kind of became a grandfather figure for me. And to cut to the chase, um, by that time, uh, he had strong contacts within the Pentagon, and within the United Nations, um, one of whom had been Secretary General U Thant in the 60s, who he got to take UFOs seriously for the first time. And then, as I entered the picture, uh, Kurt Waldheim, Secretary General, uh, this some years before we all learned uh, the scandalous fact that he had been a SS officer during the war. Awkward little detail. Oh, yeah. Um, but he was the uh, secretary general and was very interested in a theory of Coleman's that is still extremely important and rarely touched upon in UFO studies. As you know, uh, the idea, especially at the height of the Cold War in there, if a truly anomalous UFO or more entered the airspace of the United States or the Soviet Union, failed to identify when asked to, as would probably be the case, and might be perceived as a hostile force of bombers or ICBMs, it could trigger a nuclear conflagration. And Waldheim asked von Kavetsky to write a position paper about this. Um, at that time, uh, Antonio and I, my oldest contemporary colleague and, and brother in this work, were both a year or so into it. He asked us to edit that paper. Uh, it was an exercise in frustration for us because although we adored the man and we learned so much from him, um, he didn't like criticism. And um, his English was a mess. Uh, we used to call it Colmanese. Um, and <laughs> all of our editing, uh, all but all of our editing suggestions, you know, ended up on the floor uh, of the cutting room, so to say. And it's one of the reasons his work was not taken more seriously. Uh, it's terribly important work, and that was one of many papers he generated over the years, but because the grammar is so poor and because he was such a dramatic speaker, he was a true podium pounder, voice raiser, gesturing guy. He was well in his 70s when we first knew him, lived to be 89 and worked straight through. Um, I adored the guy, and again, he's tremendously courageous, but our salary, so to say, for being editors, uh, even if our work was not appreciated, was that we were invited to attend these meetings in November of 1978. And it was, as far as ufology goes, certainly um, a major moment in our lives, and I'll never forget well, it. Can I um, ask you a question? Yeah. So, um, Regarding the uh, the thesis, so the idea is, and actually Kavitsky wasn't he wasn't the first person to have this idea. You have people like Kehoe years before saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, in other words, this idea that secrecy is dangerous, 
the secrecy on UFOs is dangerous because by denying yep. the reality of this, if an actual UFO event were to to happen over American airspace, um, the military would not know. They wouldn't recognize what it is, and they would think it's Russian missiles, and that would trigger war. Uh, this idea was was floated during the 1950s and early 60s by uh, Kehoe's group, NICAP. And, and, I mean, in the logic of the time, it, it's actually it's a good tactic to take. In reality, I've always felt it was kind of a non-starter because I've always assumed that the militaries knew darn well that UFOs were real, and they were just telling the public it wasn't real. But I, I still think it was a good idea because uh, people like Kehoe and people like Von Kavitsky were working under the assumption that the government was telling us the unvarnished truth of what they believed. And so if you're going to take them at their word, you can make this argument like, no, this is very serious and you've got to, you know, you have to um, do this to prevent uh, the outbreak of war. So my question, though, is what what was Kavitsky's, do you remember the content of what he said in this? Was it interesting? Was it good? Uh, I thought it was. And again, when you come over, uh, I'll pull out the uh, my original copy. And again, and I may have a copy that you can scan. Um, he, of course, we discussed Kehoe and ICAP's pioneering this idea. One of his concerns being um, a man who had risen very high in his country's military and who approached the subject uh, of UFOs and their implications for humanity with the clear eye of a military scientist, the fact that there were personalities within the military of any country in leadership positions who might not, you know, okay, sure, it's probably one of these truly unknown things, but you know what? I, I think that we need to, you know, hit the red button here anyway and get these nukes launched because sooner or later it's going to happen. We might as well do it now. They could be, maybe they found a way to appear as truly anomalous UFOs. Um, it was, of course, um, again, it was 1978. It was not a happy time in the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. But as a fairly enthusiastic, somewhat naive, but um, mm -hmm. very dedicated uh, young individual in the work, this was a window in on another world. Yeah. Uh, it's important that people know that um, a day or two before these historic meetings began, New York was hit by a blizzard. I mean, a real city stopper. And I, I know that now many of the representatives were not keen on being there is the last place they want to be. Do I want to take this seriously and go back to the leadership of my country and suggest that we take the flying saucer phenomena seriously? I mean, there are other people who could have my cushy job in New York and my cool apartment overlooking the East River and the great nightlife that I wouldn't have, you know, in <laughs> Kiev or Zagreb or wherever. Um, and there were many empty seats uh, among, and you'll see in the photos, oh, uh, we should say that um, anybody that's interested in more information on what we're capsulizing here in the last part of the show can simply um, Google the new issue of Outer Limits magazine, uh, a publication I believe comes out of Manchester, a free, completely free monthly, and go to page 53, where there's an in-depth reminiscence on everything I'm discussing here that's fully illustrated. One of the things you'll see in a few of the pictures is the faces of certain delegates, and they are either slightly troubled or absolutely flat affect, showing no emotion whatsoever. Um, it was the first time I had ever seen Dr. Alan J. Hynek, um, Stanton Friedman, um, the second time I had ever seen him speak. Yeah. Um, Jacques Vallée uh, was a wonderful presenter. Unfortunately, the snowstorm kept Gordon Cooper uh, from being able to fly into New York. And at the time, um, he was the most outspoken uh, of the whole astronaut corps in terms of um, the reality of UFOs. But his statement was, in fact, read into the record. And for me, one of the sweetest memories of the whole thing was... Um, my mom worked for uh, the Nikon Corporation, the importer of their equipment out in Garden City, Long Island, 
My dad had his own business uh, in the jewelry district on West 47th Street. My dad closed his office early. My mom played hooky from work. And they both came and joined me in the galleries there um, in the General Assembly for the second part of the program. Again, and they were very new to this, too. Helen had sat down and I had sat down with them you know, uh, a month or so after uh, our initial breakthrough mm -hmm. on this subject and discussed it with them, and they were pretty amazingly supportive. Um, but there is a picture of me in a suit with fairly wide lapels, a pair of glasses that looked pretty trendy then, maybe a little less now, my 70s hair, and my mom with her palm mall in her hand in the lobby of the General Assembly with a big smile on her face at a time when you could smoke or burst into flame anywhere in New York. Well, Peter, we are, believe it or not, that is actually all the time that we have. Can you <laughs> can you imagine, we blew through a couple of hours. It was so interesting to hear uh, the, these pieces of UFO history uh, coming from you. You've lived it all, and, you know, I actually think people should know, uh, you are one of these people who now, you've gone through this field for so long, you've met everybody, you've <laughs> known them all, and that would be a book. Uh, that I think a lot of people would probably love mm. to read, like your encounters with all of these characters. Because really what I, I love about how you do this is you you uh, you bring to life these individuals who, uh, they're no longer with us. And yeah. they were such an important part of of creating the culture that, um, that we are in today, for those yeah. of us who follow the UFO subject. But Peter, that's it. That's all we've got time for. I just want to thank you for your time. And... Um, uh, Tracy and I will have to be down to visit you uh, in yeah. sometime soon. But in the meantime, I want to thank uh, you for your time here, and uh, we'll have to catch you again. Thanks. Good I'm night. glad to, Richard. I'll look forward to it. And I'm laughing because I'm thinking what's just happened in the last few hours is not dissimilar than many long car rides we've taken over no, the indeed. years. No, indeed. Indeed. So, well, thanks so much, Peter. We'll talk you to you bet. soon. Bye.